You'll notice this is part three. If you would like to get part one and two, uh, I have a web, I mean, a, a YouTube channel. It's my name, which is on your bulletin, Wilbur Atwood, and you'll be able to look at the first two. Now, you will understand this one without seeing the first two, but you might be interested in the other two. If you've been doing any looking on YouTube, you have become aware that there are a variety of views that are being presented. Uh, some are presenting that it's going to happen really, really soon. Other people are saying that there's no sign of a Sunday law at all. And so, you know, we don't really need to worry yet. Uh, I don't really think either one of those is exactly right. But I do want to share some things in regard to Sunday laws today. And uh, sorry, this first one's a little small. But in Prophets and Kings, page 605, it says soon, uh, no, excuse me, there's two here. First one is MTC, page 154, and it says soon the Sunday laws will be enforced. Now you can guess how long ago that was written. If it was soon then, what is it now? And the second one from Prophets and Kings 605, to secure popularity and patronage, Legislators will yield to the demand for Sunday laws. Until fairly recently, I thought that statement was still in the future. But as I have been looking at some of the information that's out there, I realize it's already been happening. We're, happening. We're just not being told about it. But there has been great pressure... And in fact, I was shocked at how much of that was taking place during the last election. And so this has been for quite some time, and it is continuing to put <clears throat> pressure on legislators and leaders of our country to have something that will change the order of things. And uh, one of the slogans that's being used is making America great. But when you read between the lines or hear some of the comments, what it means to make America great is for Christians to take hold of the government and to straighten things out. Now, there is a lot of things to get straightened out, but we understand that one of them shouldn't get straightened out, and that is to enforce a day of worship. Now, it's not going to start that way from all that we can see right now. It's going to start under the heading of climate change. And family day is not going to be presented as a day of worship. It's just that we need a day when no employer asks anybody to work and the family can be together and we can go to church, uh, but they're not saying you have to go to church. And so that's the way it appears that it is coming on the scene. And so some are saying there is a Sunday law in the pipeline. And others are saying, no, there's not. But it's all the interpretation that they're putting on things uh, that determines what they have to say. Now, we want to review just a little bit how Sunday Laws came in in the past. And actually, it started before the Dark Ages. 
this process. And the quotation is at the end. Number one, I, I put this in my own words, but you can read the quote. At first, the, this, these were when the church was making rules for, for people, and of course the church had a pretty wide uh, area of control, but it wasn't the government. So at first, they allowed work on the farm, but it was after church. So not everybody had to stop work, and, and the farmers and the people that were cultivating the land, they were able to work after church. But too many people, I guess, were not listening, and so they took another step. Uh, those in holy office could not pass judgment on Sunday. So it's limiting their ability to, you know, hear cases and render a judgment on Sunday. Well, not sure. There we go. Then it wasn't too long until uh, all common labor was forbidden. And not only forbidden, if you didn't listen, there were fines or even stripes given because of it. Rich men would lose half of their estate. If they, if they worked on Sunday, half of your wealth is gone. And if still disobedient, would be made slaves. So they really meant business by that time. I'm not sure whether I'm... Um, okay, well, we got two of them. Number five, the poor were to suffer perpetual banishment. In other words, you no longer belong to this country. You're, you're gone. You've got to go someplace else. And finally, though, on number six, they saw that they had to get the secular power involved. So the secular authorities joined the church to enforce uh, Sunday laws. And you'll find that in a little different wording in uh, Day Dawn, pages 25 and 26, one of Ellen White's uh, Morning Watch books. We have no reason to think it would be any different now. It's going to start mildly and progress. Well, <laughs> now why is all this happening? I believe the Bible tells us why. Paul is especially aware of this. And in Acts 20, verses 29 and 30, he said, <clears throat> For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He's talking about the Christian church. And he's saying, I can already tell you that soon there are going to be grievous wolves that are going to come in and make believe that they are a Christian and they're going to become a member of the church and they're going to cause trouble because they're really not a sheep. They're a wolf. Well, that's been happening for so long that we're down at the end now to where they have done their work and the ideas have been changed. Do you know what the idea of religious liberty is today? And they say it, really meaning it, the idea of religious liberty is we got to take over the government. We need to stop Christians from being hindered and they need to have freedom to take over the government. That's religious freedom. Now, you can read the need for the Constitution to be changed, but some of the comments that I've heard by leaders, we don't need a change of 
of the Constitution, they have reinterpreted it in their own mind. And so they've reinterpreted what is religious liberty. Well, we know what religious liberty meant when this country was founded. It meant that no religion was to be told how to practice their religion by the government. That was true religious freedom. But now, the label that they are giving us is secularists. Anybody that doesn't want to have the government control what goes on in this country uh, with the religion involved in it is a secularist. And there is, going, there is building a hatred against all secularists. And if you are a true believer in religious liberty, you are a secularist secularist in their eyes. But that was only the first problem. He says, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So double trouble. We got people infiltrating the Christian church, and don't think that they've overlooked the Adventist church. We have infiltrators infiltrating the Christian churches and changing the way people think about things, very slowly, but changing the way people think about things. But then we have what I call the Savior Syndrome. We have people that are studying their Bible, and they come up with what they think is something very valuable, and it's new, and everybody's got to hear this and got to accept it. The only problem is it's not true. It's not true. And between those two things, we are now on the tail end of the activity from those two uh, type of, of deceptions. This was so important that he talked about it to Timothy. Now, Timothy was a young pastor, and it looks like Paul was thinking that when I die, he can continue the work. And so he was trying to make sure that he understood clearly how to do his work. And here's what he tells him in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they, talking about church members, will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. <clears throat> and they shall turn away their ears from the truth <coughs> and shall be turned unto fables. Let me just put in my own words what that is telling us would happen. Pastors who would preach the exact truth would get thrown out because the congregation does not want to hear straight truth. They want to hear fables. And so, if a pastor wants to be successful, he has to preach to the itching ears. He has to give them what they want. And if he doesn't, he doesn't get a big church. He does, when he puts something on the internet, he doesn't get 70,000 views or 100,000 views. He doesn't get that. And so this also has been taking place for a very long time. And there's very few churches that want a pastor that's going to tell them exactly what the truth is. That's the only reason I come here, because it seems like most of you want to hear it. Maybe all of you. I hope all of you. But, you know, this is a serious problem, and it has created this change over time in most everybody's thinking. Now, here are some of the things 
that are already in place, and I've referred to some of them already. Trump, and I'm not saying this as a political thing, I am not a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, I go where, you know, I don't even vote because we're told we're responsible what they do when they're in office if we vote, so I don't even vote. But I'm just saying this because this is what has been said. Trump and many leaders in public office have an incorrect view of religious liberty. This is very serious. Now, you've heard for years probably that some of the judges in the Supreme Court have spoken against religious liberty. Right now, we have six in office in the judges that belong to the organization that wants a Sunday law again. And so, if your case were to come before the Supreme Court, you know what kind of decision would be made. But now we're adding uh, a president and other leaders who are also developing that incorrect view of religious liberty. Trump and many leaders believe that separation of church and state is wrong. They look at all <clears throat> of the bad things that have happened and you know, probably the worst one of all is when in this country a decision could be made that same-sex marriage is legal. Now, if people want to do that, you know, that's up to them. But for us, <coughs> as a country, to make it legal and to <coughs> punish people who don't want to support that, yes, I can see why Christians say, wait a minute, things have gone wrong. But you know the devil knows how to maneuver. The devil worked that one in to get the people stirred up to go too far to try to straighten it out. And that's what's uh, probably underneath all this, that and a number of other issues. Third, those who want separation of church and state are called secularists. Can you imagine, as a Seventh-day Adventist, getting labeled a secularist? I mean, if we follow our faith, we're the farthest, farthest thing from a secularist. Well, we're going to get that label. Uh, right now, it, it may not be applied to Seventh-day Adventists, but it's, it's coming And number four, there's heavy promotion of no work on Sunday so it can be a family day. Now, one of the problems that we face with this topic is that they know not to stir up Seventh-day Adventists and others that have a view like we do. So they're working in a very sneaky, underhanded way, and they are way down the road before people are thinking much about it. And so the groundwork is pretty well laid. How long it will be, only God knows. I don't think we should get in the business of predicting when it will be, because at any time, we're told, that angels speak through the men in legislature and stop certain things from happening. And so God can postpone it as long as he chooses to, but we need to know that if he doesn't postpone it, it's right on us. I'm not sure where pointing this really works, but... <clears throat> In last day events, page 125 and 6, it says, the Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. That means undercover. 
hidden as far as possible from the view. The leaders are concealing the true issue, and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whether the undercurrent is tending. We can just picture, based on this, how angry with themselves some of these men are going to be in the future when they find out what ends up because of their view of religious liberty. And yet, there are other people that know what they're doing, and they're engineering this and working on this to bring it to pass. So, <clears throat> many people, we need to be careful not to blame anybody, because they might be one that once they see the outcome, they wish they hadn't done it, and they may join us. So, we need to be very careful about that. They are working in blindness. They do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that have made them a free, independent nation, and through legislation brings into the Constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusion, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of the dark ages. Now, one thing we have to keep in mind when we study this subject, and I recommend every one of you, if you haven't studied it recently, I've studied it in the past, but you don't remember the finer details. So my recommendation is that you study it again. One of the things we have to keep in mind is that this was written in regard to a Sunday law that was being prepared back at the turn of the century uh, in the late 1800s. The one that takes place now may not follow exactly the path that that one followed. And like I said, I'm not sure when I hear the reasoning that people are giving that they will have to change the Constitution. Their view has changed, and they can just go forward with that if enough people let them do it. In Last Day Events, page 127, there are many who are at ease, who are, as it were, asleep. Now, I hope nobody is like that here, but praise God, if you are, there's still time to wake up. They say, if prophecy has foretold the enforcement of Sunday observance, the law will surely be enacted, and having come to this conclusion, they sit down in a calm expectation of the event, comforting themselves with the thought that God will protect his people in the day of trouble. But God will not save us if we make no effort to do the work he has committed to our charge. That's why we are sleeping. We are doing very little to stop Sunday laws from developing. And one of the reasons why Sunday laws are so far down the road is because we have not been doing much. And in one of the other uh, sermons, I talk a little more about that. But this is, has been very dangerous. Back when, in the late 1800s, we had Jones and some others that joined him, and they went to work to have an all-out campaign to defeat the Sunday law, and God blessed them in being able to defeat it. But what have we done? Very little. And one of the things that we've done very little in regard to is getting the book, Great Controversy, in the hands of, you know, a wide scale of people, especially leaders, to get that in their hands. But there's many other things that we need to do. In Last Day Events 126, there's something we can all uh, get involved with, and that is prayer. 
says it is our duty to do all in our power to avert the threatened danger. It's talking about Sunday laws. We need to do everything in our power. We need to get busy sharing with our friends and neighbors and business associates material that will open their eyes on religious liberty and Sunday laws. Because if we don't do it now, it's going to go right in there and they won't even know till it's too late. Also, a vast responsibility is devolving upon men and women of prayer throughout the land to petition that God may sweep back this cloud of evil and give a few more years of grace to work for the master. We're not ready. The world is not ready for this. But God wants us to really get serious about pleading with him to give us some more time to where we can do the work that we failed to do already. If we had been completely faithful, doing everything possible, maybe then we could say, well, it must be time for the Sunday laws to come. But because of our failure, it's not the time, it's not the best time for it to happen. And so God is calling us to prayer and to getting literature out and talking to people and so on. In Last Day Events, page 126 and 7, those who are now keeping the commandments of God need to bestir themselves that they may obtain the special help which God alone can give them. They should work more earnestly to delay as long as possible the threatened calamity. So I hope nobody here, if you thought before you came here, well, just let it come. It's time for it to come. If you thought that, I hope when you go, you don't think that, that you go out of here determined to do all you can to postpone it. Don't worry. It won't be postponed beyond what God wants. We won't be able to do it. No matter how much we pray, no matter how much literature and effort we put in, we won't be able to. So... We are to be as diligent as possible. Now this is the one that has been talked about a lot, but as I've been studying, and I have some more studying I'm going to do, I'm not sure that this is going to be the first one. Uh, I wish we were told more, but Anyway, there are clues if we study. But I'm not sure it's going to be the first one. Last Day Events, page 133 and 4. When our nation in its legislative councils shall enact laws to bind the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance. Notice that? Enforcing Sunday observance. Back when we had the problem with Sunday, right after the apostolic church began to lose its power and we started having trouble, they didn't start with a, a law that enforced Sunday keeping. And so it's likely that it's not going to be that way again. But there will be, uh, you know, religious laws. And if the climate change is signed, it's, in a sense, a small item in the climate change, and it may be able to pass through with signatures, you know, without people really thinking about Sunday too much. We think about it, or should be, enforcing Sunday observance and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh-day Sabbath. The law of God will, to all intents and purposes, be made void in our land. And national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. Now, I can imagine the disappointment 
that's going to happen that with this idea that to allow religion to control what the government does is going to make America great again. And it is true. The Bible says, righteousness exalteth a nation. If we lived righteously in this country, and if leaders were righteous, it would exalt the nation and make America great again. But they're in for a big disappointment. Instead of America becoming great, America is going to collapse. National apostasy will be followed by national ruin. So if we love our country, we have another reason to try to help people see it straight. Now there's another one on this that I thought was even stronger. Last Day Events, page 134. This national apostasy will speedily be followed by national ruin. So the other one doesn't say anything about how fast, but this one says speedily it will be followed by national ruin. When the government, with its different entities, makes the decision, and again, that it will be escalated. We don't know which one this is talking about. Maybe it's the final one where it says, you cannot keep the seventh day. And churches are padlocked and people are not allowed to meet in the open on Sabbath and, and those kind of laws. That may be uh, when this really happens. But there, there's probably more than one law that's going to get passed. But when, when it's escalated, then the ruin is going to come. And then... It's going to spread throughout the world. Now, the world has already, in some places, uh, got more laws than what we do in this country. For instance, Germany, a number of years ago, they passed a law that businesses had to be closed on Sunday. And uh, that's been in place for quite some time. But what we're looking for is the one that the United States kicks off and then it spreads to the world. And here we see in last day events, page 136, the whole world is to be stirred with enmity against Seventh-day Adventists because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday, the institution of this anti-Christian power. So here we have evidence, and there's quite a few references about it taking place all over the world. You know, if they excommunicate you from the United States and no other country will accept you, can you imagine what's going to be the situation? And so as we look forward to this, I think one of the most important things for us is to be getting ready spiritually because... Many of us, if we had to face it tomorrow, we wouldn't be strong enough spiritually to stay true. And even some of us that think we would, wouldn't. And so the only protection we have is to really make our spiritual life first and to make sure that we are cultivating a closer and closer relationship with Jesus so that when it happens, we'll be able to stand. And another thing that's very important, right now, he doesn't give us the faith to withstand the full pressure that's going to come. So don't let yourself get scared. Don't say, well, I could never uh, be true during that time because, you know, it's too hard. I can't do it. Don't allow your mind to think along that path. Because you are not given the faith to stand until the time. When you need it, that's when you, you get it. 
but it only is for those that have been doing what they can to prepare. Then he gives to them what they need to be successful in that hour. And page 137, Babylon will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Every nation will be involved. Now part of that is from the Bible, and it adds that to make it really clear. Every nation on earth will be involved in this matter. And we, in this country, are rapidly moving to kick it off throughout the rest of the world. Also, page 137, in the great conflict between faith and unbelief, the whole Christian world will be involved. So Christians are going to rule the world, and they are going to somehow attain ascendancy over other groups to rule the world and cause every nation to pass these Sunday laws. May God help us to acquaint ourselves all we can with as many details so that we can watch as things move forward and be careful on the internet. You'll get confronted with all kinds of things. Don't fall for all those interpretations, but follow the Bible, spirit of prophecy, stick with what that says, and you'll be safe.